grown all the way north to Monterey County. Um, and these coastal regions are characterized by their moderate temperatures. So they have cooler summers and warmer winters, as well as uh, warm days and cool nights with a marine layer fog. And it's exactly these environmental conditions that uh, allow the beautiful strawberries on the right of the screen to be produced. However, it also allows for powdery mildew to grow. And this here is a strawberry that's been completely colonized by powdery mildew. Um, one second here, I am going to take off my mask because it's getting hard to breathe in between talking. But so this strawberry here has been completely colonized by powdery mildew. You can see the, both the signs and the symptoms of these white powdery lesions all over the fruit. The leaves can also be infected with the same looking white powdery colonies, but the symptoms can also be a little more subtle on the plant leaves and cause leaf curl and purple blotching. So there's a, a full spectrum of signs and symptoms that can be seen with strawberry powdery mildew. And then not only can it affect the leaves and the fruit, but it can affect all the above ground plant parts of the strawberry. And so pretty much everything you see there except the crown and roots of the plant can be affected by strawberry powdery mildew. And then just a little biology on the disease. It's caused by the pathogen, so by the fungus, Podospora aphanes. Uh, Podospora aphanes is an obligate biotroph, which means it requires uh, live plant tissue to complete some part of its life cycle. In the case of powdery mildew, the entire life cycle is carried out on live plant tissue. It's host specific, meaning that it only affects strawberry plants, so Podospora aphanes will not infect other plants, so you'll see a powdery mildew of grape or on sycamore or something, that's a different causal agent. It reproduces via conidia in California. So this life cycle you see on the right has two cycles to it as a sexual cycle or stage on the left where it produces chasmothesia and an asexual stage on the right where it produces conidia. And that is what we see most commonly in California. Uh, Chasmothesia have been seen before, but are not thought to be the primary inoculum of powdery mildew in California. It's favored by cooler temperatures, uh, so around 15 to 25 degrees Celsius, and high relative humidity. And so knowing the environmental conditions that influence strawberry powdery mildew allow growers to take their first steps toward controlling it, which should always be cultural control. And so integrated pest management or IPM recommends cultural control as the first line of defense. It's most often preventative. So done before the disease even shows up, but it can be done curatively in, in this uh, certain instance, you see the, the tractor towing a UV device that actually is used to treat powdery mildew once it's found in the field and damage it so it can't repair itself. But most cultural control is done preventatively. And so that's done first through environmental modification and that can be done through overhead irrigation, uh, although that's not very common in strawberries because it's favorable to other pathogen development. However, Canidia of strawberry powdery mildew will not germinate in free water, which is actually a pretty unique trait for uh, a fungus in general. And then another way of environmental modification that's actually conducive to powdery mildew development is the hoop house that you see uh, at the top of the screen here. And then finally, uh, there is host plant resistance, which is a very valuable tool to any grower who struggles with powdery mildew because having a variety that will uh, become less infected just by just by planting a different plant is is key. But mildew is very hard to detect, especially at the early stages, and it can very quickly develop and become a problem. And that's when a lot of growers turn to chemical control. And so chemical control is most often curative. It can be done with a variety of fungicides that either have single sites, so they target one process of fungal metabolism or development, uh, or they can be multi-site, which uh, target multiple sites on the fungus. They can be biological, 
uh, often a bacteria that will produce compounds that's detrimental to the development of the fungus. And you can see that there are all these options on the right in this chart that are, they're all the fungicides labeled for control of strawberry powdery mildew in California. However, if you pay attention to the column on the right, the FRAC code, that's a code assigned by the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. And if a product shares the same number with another product and the fungus becomes resistant to that product, it will likely have cross resistance to other products. So you can see there's a lot of threes, a lot of sevens and a lot of 11s on this chart. So if resistance develops to one of those numbers, all those products are off the table for a grower. But before like talking specifically about fungicide resistance in strawberry powdery mildew, I wanna just go a little deeper into how fungicide resistance occurs. So you have an initial population and it's all sensitive individuals. However, a fungicide application can select for an intermediate individual that say had a mutation and mutations in fungus occur all the time. Uh, they occur at random rates, but it is the selection pressure from the fungicide that makes the mutation conferring resistance so significant. And so you can see an intermediate individual has appeared here and then it's allowed to reproduce and becomes a little more representative of the population uh, along with the sensitive individuals. And then another fungicide application is made and those resistant individuals or intermediate individuals uh, are allowed to live on and again, reproduce. And this cycle continues until you have a almost fully resistant population. And so this is a problem in uh, many fungi and with, um, yeah, with most fungi that growers will make chemical applications for. But I just want to touch on the, the research that's been done with powdery mildews. So resistance to fungicides has been documented in uh, FRAC codes 3, 7, 11, 13, and U6 in other powdery mildews. Uh, most of these powdery mildews are the ones causing the, the disease in grape, um, cucurbit, so like the gourd family, cucumbers, uh, pumpkins, things like that, and wheat and barley. And those are much, uh, powdery mildew in those cropping systems is a very, very significant issue. And so the research, there's been a lot more research and therefore a lot more resistance characterized within those powdery mildews. There have been a couple of studies studying fungicide resistance in strawberry powdery mildew, and there has been resistance found by, in FRAC codes three and 11. However, these studies have um, only been with strawberry powdery mildew in Italy and Israel. And so there hasn't been any documented resistance in strawberry powdery mildew in the United States. And then just to touch on the previous research in host resistance, evaluations have been done before and they've been done in California and Florida. However, the one done in California was in 1996. And so cultivars in strawberry especially um, rapidly turn over. And so none of the cultivars evaluated in that initial California trial are uh, used today in California production. And then the Florida evaluation was in 2013. And a lot of the cultivars used in Florida are also not used in California. So there's not a currently published evaluation of cultivars grown in California or of host resistance of cultivars grown in California. So with those gaps identified, I'm gonna go into the experiments that uh, try to address these, these knowledge gaps. We'll start off with the fungicide resistance assay. And the objective of this assay was to characterize resistance of Podospora fanis in California to fungicides used for its control. So it all starts out when I get a sample. And so I either go out to a field, I get a, I get a call from a grower or um, someone working with the strawberry commission that says, hey, we have powdery mildew or I get it shipped to me from a grower or someone at the commission. And it's always in this brown paper bag with the information on it. And it's 
always infected leaves and fruit. And what I do when I get this sample and I go out to our fields here at the Strawberry Center and I collect um, unfolded, so young developing Monterey leaves. And it's key that they're still unfolded and in early development because that's when they're most susceptible to infection. I separate the trifoliate leaves into leaflets and I sterilize them in 0.5% bleach and um, a drop of tween per liter as a surfactant. And I sterilize them for three minutes and then wash them with water. And I put them on this device called the Anderson Spore Cascader. And that's essentially like a vacuum with these perforated plates that allows for even distribution of the inoculum. And um, then I use a camel hair brush to brush the sporulating colonies <coughs> off the infected leaves or fruit from the samples. So this is what that looks like when the vacuum's on. And the whole purpose of this first brushing is I don't know how much of the mildew is alive or how old some of these colonies are. And so I want to use a standard amount of inoculum for the fungicide assay. So this is just to, like nothing is treated yet here. This is just to produce a standard amount of inoculum that I know how old it is to use in the fungicide assay. And so once I brush it through the Anderson Cascader onto the susceptible leaflets, I then put it in a growth chamber for two weeks at 20 degrees Celsius and 16 hours um, light, eight hours dark. And the relative humidity within the chamber doesn't matter because they're on these uh, Petri dishes, which are full of water auger modified with a, a fungicide called benzimidazole just to make sure no contamination grows. But that water auger in the closed Petri dish um, keeps the relative humidity near 100%, which is favorable to powdery mildew development. Another big plus of the Petri plates is that it reduces contamination, or so I can have multiple isolates in the growth chamber at one time. And this was proved by every negative control that I did when I got an isolate had no mildew growth through the 19 isolates I processed. And so from here, after two weeks, I then go back out to the field and I get more susceptible leaflets and I treat them with fungicides. And so I have a video here showing how I treat these leaflets with fungicide. And I dip them for about one second each time, three times for each leaflet, and then dry it off. And I put them onto a plate of auger. So, these are the six treatments that uh, were used in the fungicide assay. And so they represent a diverse range of frac codes. You can see we have one from each major number as well as a combination product, uh, fluopyram and trifloxystrobin. And they were all applied at the minimum labeled rate. And one treatment was made up of three plates of auger with three treated leaves on each plate. And so I would take these treated leaves and put them into the Anderson spore cascader. And so what you're seeing here is the closed cascader with the treated leaves inside. But then the difference from in this picture from the first one is that these are the leaves with the, or the leaflets with the standardized inoculum. And so they, the powdery mildew has been developing on these leaflets for two weeks and I brush approximately a one square centimeter lesion five times into the cascader to make sure I get as even of an inoculation on each treated plate as possible. And then those treated plates, treated and inoculated plates go into the growth chamber again for another two weeks uh, at 20 degrees Celsius in the same light dark. And so, this after two weeks, this is what the leaflets can look like. So on the left is a plate of disease-free leaflets. And on the right is a plate of leaflets showing signs of mildew infection. So I know it's hard to see, but I want you to, uh, I want to take a second here and see if you can recognize where the powdery mildew is on the, the leaflets on the right. So if you didn't see it, that's okay. Uh, we have it circled here. It is rather tough to see, and that's why all the um, 
ratings I do for disease incidents are under a dissecting microscope. And so I'm not looking with the naked eye, but I'm looking through a microscope uh, up to five times magnification to identify uh, presence of disease. And so the rating here, um, this plate on the right would get 100% disease incidence because three out of the three leaves had powdery mildew on it. And that was the measurement we used for, or I used for this trial. And so I want to show you the results of the 19 isolates of powdery mildew that I process. And you can see here disease incidence is on the y-axis going from zero to 100 and the treatments are on the x-axis. And so here we have the non-treated, the control being the highest, which is what we should be seeing. And then a range of efficacy in the other treatments. And so again, this is, this is not speaking to the resistance of any individual isolate. This is over all 19 isolates, but overall pentheopyrad was uh, significantly less effective than the trifloxystrobin, cyflufenamid, and fluopyram and trifloxystrobin treatments. And fluopyram and trifloxystrobin, our combination treatment, was the most effective on stifling powdery mildew disease incidence. So I just wanted to give that, that general overview, but again, that doesn't speak to any single isolate being resistant. But now I have a chart of all 19 isolates and how they performed uh, with regards to each treatment. And at the bottom, you can see I have the total number of resistant isolates for each treatment. And so this was characterized as over 66% disease incidence. And so I've highlighted all the resistant isolates in red here. And you can see with the pentheopyrad, quinoxifen, and mycobutanol, there were all either over a third or almost a third of the isolates tested were uh, considered resistant to those treatments. And then another uh, very interesting, or another thing of interest, the fluopyram and trifloxystrobin treatment didn't have a single isolate with a disease incidence over 11%. And then another very interesting thing I wanted to point out was that we had two isolates from organic production systems that were entirely sensitive to every single product used against them. And so this is sort of to be expected, but it was, it was really good to see this because uh, in theory, these isolates or the mildew collected from these fields has not been exposed to the conventional fungicides that were used to treat the leaflets. So this is all, all good news and good to see, but we wanted to make sure that this fungicide assay was viable. And so we went ahead and did a live plant trial as well. And we set that up by uh, establishing Monterey uh, strawberry plants in six inch pots in a mixture of peat, perlite, and coconut core. And they were overhead irrigated for four weeks. After four weeks, we moved the plants into the greenhouse uh, but before moving them, we ensured that each plant was free of disease by just looking all around and making sure there were no signs or symptoms of powdery mildew. And in the greenhouse, there was an active powdery mildew epidemic going on on mature plants. And instead of overhead irrigation, which would stifle mildew growth, the plants were irrigated with spike emitters. And so this is what a plot of plants looked like um, in the greenhouse. It's four plants arranged two by two. And each treatment, each fungicide treatment had four reps. So four reps of four plants each. And then in between each, uh, each rep of plants or each plot of four was a inoculum or spreader plant. And this is what they looked like on the day of transfer. Again, I'm gonna ask you guys, this one's a little easier to see, but see if you can identify the mildew on that plant. And yeah, I've only circled a couple lesions here, but it's, um, yeah, it's really starting to develop on these plants. And these plants were entirely the inoculum for the trial. So we didn't shake any plants or do any uh, canopy disturbance with these plants. We just let the ambient mildew in the air infect all the plots of plants. And so, this now is when the first signs appear, I won't make you guys recognize the lesion again, but as the first signs appeared on the 
treated plants or the plants that were going to be treated, we went ahead and made weekly fungicide applications for six weeks. And then after six, after six weeks, we waited two more weeks to simulate the 14 days of the lab assay after treatment to rate the plants. And so we also rated the plants for disease incidence. Um, and this time it was characterized as the number of infected leaves per plot divided by the total number of leaves per plot. And then at the same time, we took the infected material from the control plots and we used it in the lab assay. And so we compared the results from the greenhouse, from the live plant evaluation in the lab assay. Oh, I also just wanted to show you how we did the, the ratings here as well. <laughs> Um, this was a good visual we took for our field day. And so here I am going through here with someone writing notes behind me. And I'm basically marking every leaf that has disease incidence. And so you'd think it would be problematic disturbing the, the canopy like this, but the amount of inoculum in the air is so high already that it, it really doesn't matter. Um, we didn't disturb the canopy for two weeks uh, before the plants started showing symptoms of mildew. So it was already, it's, it's all over in the air and touching the plants doesn't really make a significant transfer from plot to plot. And so the results for the live plant assay, uh, we had again, the non-treated being the highest. I also wanna point out that the disease incidence is much lower than the, the lab assay here. So this is, these are relative differences, but you can see the non-treated is only at about 17%. And so all treatments are significantly different from the non-treated control. And the highest disease incidence is with uh, quinoxifen, mycobutanol, and pinthiopyrad. And then lower in the disease incidence was trifloxystrobin, cyclofenamid, and again, at the lowest, fluopyram and trifloxystrobin. And then comparing this to the lab assay, it lined up pretty well, but there were some discrepancies. Mainly, mycobutanol was entirely sensitive in the lab assay, and uh, trifloxystrobin was not significantly different from quinoxifen or pinthiopyrad. And th those were the two main discrepancies, but we ran a, a Pearson test for correlation and got a correlation coefficient of 0 0.6. And that led to a p-value of 0 0.004, saying that these two uh, tests, the lab assay and a live plant trial, are statistically correlated. So moving on to the conclusions of the fungicide resistance assay. This study documents resistance of Podospora fannies in California to FRAC codes 3, 7, and 13. That is mycobutanol, pinthiopyrad, and quinoxifen, respectively. Isolates from organic production are sensitive to all products. And so this suggests resistance is a localized trait. This could be due to one of two things we've theorized. Uh, one is that due to the ephemeral nature of conidia, they actually don't make it too far outside of the field from which they're developed or uh, canidia that would germinate and create a population that would confer resistance to fungicides would not be able to outcompete a more fit isolate that might not have that mutation in an organic field in the absence of selection pressure from fungicides. This would be something really interesting to do more studies on and see uh, what is actually causing this localized trait of resistance. Uh, the fewest isolates showed resistance to fluopyram and trifloxystrobin, and this is sort of to be expected. Uh, both integrated pest management and FRAC recommend using products uh, or mixes of products that have two separate modes of action. So this just further drives home that point. And finally, the correlation between the lab assay and the live plant trial shows that the lab assay is a viable alternative to doing these trials on live plants. And that's huge because you can have multiple isolates going at once in the lab assay and it requires much, much less space. All right, I'm gonna take some water here and then move on to the next chapter. Now we'll go on to host resistance. And 
The objective of this experiment was to characterize host plant resistance of commonly grown California strawberry cultivars to powdery mildew infection. So this is just a list of the cultivars we used in three different trials. There was, uh, these cultivars were from four different breeding programs, UC Davis, Plant Sciences, Driscoll's, and Lassen Canyon. And we did three separate trials. And so the first trial was uh, done in the winter of 2020 at the Cal Poly Greenhouse. It involved 12 cultivars and each cultivar had four plots of four plants. There's then a summer trial that was essentially a repeat of the winter trial. However, we uh, did not use the two Driscoll's cultivars, but we picked up a few cultivars from UC Davis and a couple of cultivars from Lassen Canyon. And then finally, we uh, did a field evaluation that studied the 10 shared cultivars uh, between the winter and summer trials in two fields that we have here at the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. And there were five plots of each cultivar in each field. So these slides are gonna look very similar to the live plant trial because the winter greenhouse trial and the live plant fungicide trial were actually established at the exact same time. So the only difference here is that we're using different cultivars instead of just Monterey. So the plants were established in the same way in six inch pots in peat, perlite, and coconut core, and they were overhead irrigated. And then after four weeks, they were moved into the greenhouse, uh, ensured that they were entirely disease free. And again, there is an active powdery mildew epidemic present and spike emitter irrigation did not stifle the, the progress of the mildew. And again, this, the plots looked exactly the same as the live plant assay. So, this is what they looked like on the day we moved them into the greenhouse. And that is what the average inoculum spreader plant looked like. I just put it here again to, to give a good visual of it. And then the ratings were slightly different in these, in these greenhouse trials than the ratings for the, the fungicide assay. And so we did these ratings at 40 and 41 days in the winter and summer greenhouse trials respectively. Excuse me. And we evaluated for disease incidence, which again was the number of infected leaves divided by the total number of leaves per plot. And then also measured disease severity, which was the total percent of the leaf area colonized um, for each infected leaf in each plot. And then the score reported in all the following graphs that you'll see is foliar disease severity, which is the disease incidence for each plot <coughs> times the average severity of each plot. In the field evaluation, we collected five leaves from each plot with a preference toward those showing symptoms. And we just evaluated those leaves for disease severity. So total percent area or total leaf surface area colonized by powdery milk. So we'll start with the winter greenhouse trial results first. And on the left here, we have foliar disease severity. I want you to notice that it goes from zero to 25. Um, and then we have the cultivars on the x-axis. And so there was a wide range in between the cultivars. Uh, BG 3.324 especially was, was far and away more susceptible than any of the other cultivars. Royal Rice was up there as well. And then we had a lot in this sort of middle range from BG 4.367 to Driscoll's two. And then on the more resistant end or less susceptible end, we had San Andreas and Sweet Ann. And so as I move through the next two uh, graphs or charts, I want you to keep observing BG 3.324 and Sweet Ann because those are sort of the uh, susceptible and uh, resistant metrics that stayed consistent through the three trials. So in the summer greenhouse uh, trial, we had uh, 16 cultivars. And something that's different about this is the foliar disease severity, the y-axis only goes from zero to 12. And so it was significantly shifted down. And I think that's just because there was, uh, we didn't see as much susceptibility from BG 3.324, although it was still the most susceptible in this trial. And then over on the right side, we have Sweet Ann, but it also was not the uh, least susceptible in this trial. In fact, the two new UC varieties that we ended up evaluating are two varieties new to this trial 
Valiant and Fronteris were the least susceptible. And then in the field evaluations for disease severity, everything held pretty consistent between field A and field B. Um, and again, with the 10 shared varieties between the winter and summer trials, we have again, BG 3.324 as the most susceptible and Sweet Ann as the least. And so we also ran, or I also ran Pearson correlation tests between each of the field evaluations and the greenhouse trials. So there were six different comparisons and every single trial and evaluation was significantly correlated except for field A and the winter greenhouse. And that was just barely off, but everything else correlated very well. And so from these results, we can draw conclusions. There is a range of host resistance. Uh, and this is a pretty obvious statement, but it's a very useful one to growers in California. So BG 3.324 and Royal Rice were the most susceptible and San Andreas, Sweet Ann and Fronteras were the least susceptible. This is also um, important because it drives home or supports the conclusion that powdery mildew host resistance is driven by multiple genes. There wasn't any single totally resistant or totally susceptible cultivar, there was a, a clear range. So there was, there was no distinct difference between any two cultivars. Um, or sorry, between, there, there was no distinct difference in between all of the cultivars. So there wasn't a only susceptible and only resistant end. No cultivar showed full resistance. This uh, supports uh, literature from the 1996 uh, greenhouse and field evaluations done in California, but uh, contradicts findings from the 2013 study done in Florida. And I think that comes down to just difference in sampling methods. And uh, with all the correlation or the significant correlation between the field trials and greenhouse trials, I think that greenhouse trials are a viable substitute for field trials. This allows a uh, these trials to be done or these evaluations to be done year round because you can keep a consistent amount of inoculum in your greenhouse versus in the field, you have to wait for the ideal conditions. And so you can get more trials done every year evaluating host resistance in a greenhouse than a field. And finally, I do think that this information is a very useful tool to growers as the cultivars evaluated represent over 55% of the acreage in California. So. This definitely fills that, that gap in the literature that um, of now there is a published report of cultivars commonly grown in California today. And then we'll move on now. Uh, so just a short chapter on gene mutation detection. And so the objective of this study was to isolate the cytochrome B region of Podospora fanis to identify individuals containing the G143A mutation. And I know there's a lot of jargon there, so I'm going to try and break it down with a little bit of background. And so G143A is, uh, is a glycine to alanine or alanine um, amino acid shift at position 143 within the cytochrome B complex. And so what is important about that is cytochrome B has a, a central role in cell metabolism in the mitochondria. And so a fungicide from FRAC group 11 blocks that essential role in uh, the cell's metabolism. And so this mutation, this one shift allows the fungus to overcome the uh, mechanism or the mode of action from that fungicide and continue uh, metabolizing normally. This mutation is best detected via PCR or polymerase chain reaction. And so it starts out by extracting DNA from your fungus. And so you take a, in the case of powdery mildew, infected tissue. So uh, leaf tissue infected with powdery mildew and you mash it up and then you break it down and mix it with a series of enzymes and buffers and that extracts the DNA and you then take that DNA and you mix it into this uh, master mix with specific primers. And the primers have sequences of um, amino acids that are supposed to isolate the cytochrome B region in this case. 
in that fungal DNA. And the way you isolate this region is you put it through a, a cycle of different temperatures that breaks down the DNA, allows the primers to attach to that region of DNA and then amplify the attached region uh, over and over and over and you do it for 30 or so cycles. And then you have this PCR product from this thermocycler and you load it into a stained gel. So it, the, gel, the gel stained with gel red allows you to see the DNA fragments and you run electricity through the gel to separate out the DNA fragments and then you visualize the fragments under UV light. And so that's done typically in like a black box machine with a computer program. And that's how you identify the, the cytochrome B region. And then, uh, then uh, individuals with the G143A mutation will have a fragment either not show up or at a different position on the gel than sensitive individuals. So primers and protocol have been developed in other powdery mildews, uh, but not yet for strawberry powdery mildew. And so we, uh, this project was sort of a, a long shot in the way that it's, it's a very, it's the scale of a much larger project to sequence an entire genome of a fungal pathogen and then develop primers to isolate that specific region within that fungus. So uh, we tried using primers and protocol for a related fungus, uh, Podospora xanthii, or powdery mildew of cucurbit. And we tried to see if we could isolate the Podospora fannies cytochrome B with that. And uh, sort of expectedly, it did not happen. You can see here we have um, four isolate or four uh, yeah, isolates of fungus tested. And so the primers and protocol worked for Podospora xanthii, but they did not work for Podospora aphanes. And so I think that um, this is going to be the, the scale of a much larger project. We weren't able to isolate it with that primers and protocol. So specific primers must be developed. And again, this is, this is more something within the scope of an entire master's project or even a part of a, a PhD. And then finally, I wanna move on to just talk about this first report of uh, a novel fungal pathogen on strawberry. And this wasn't necessarily the focus of my master's work. And I had started working on this with the, the names listed up there um, before actually starting my master's, but this was something that we already have published. And so it was a very valuable experience for, for me to go through to um, Kyle Blauer recognized the pathogen in a post-harvest study for uh, botrytis. And he saw this black sporulating lesion. And so we took it back to the lab and isolated it on auger and it appeared to be aspergillus. And then we took it from the auger and inoculated a clean fruit and it saw that it again infected the fruit. And then we were able to isolate it again from the fruit back on to the auger, thus completing Koch's postulates and verifying that we saw an aspergillus rot um, causing a disease of strawberry. And so uh, morphologically, looking at this under the dissecting scope, it appeared to be Aspergillus niger, but we got the, um, we sequenced certain parts of the, the genome and saw that it in fact was a closer match to Aspergillus tubingensis. So it was initially going to be a first report of Aspergillus niger in California, but this uh, seeing Aspergillus tubingensis causing strawberry fruit rot is actually novel worldwide. And so this was a really exciting um, publication and sort of uh, exciting first way to dip my toes into the, the publishing world. And you can see this paper in plant disease. And yeah, um, the other two chapters that we are planning on publishing are going to be the fungicide resistance one that's going to be submitted to plant disease. And then the host resistance chapter is going to be submitted to Plant Health Progress. And just to move in now to a summary, what we discuss, 
fungicide resistance uh, has been documented in Podospora fannies in California. Cultivars grown in California today have shown a range of host resistance to strawberry powdery mildew. And identifying G143A in strawberry powdery mildew needs to be the focus of a larger project. And with that, I just wanted to um, give some thank yous. I want to thank the California Strawberry Commission for funding these projects and for funding my graduate education. Um, wouldn't be able to be here without that. And then I wanted to thank my committee, Dr. Gerald Holmes, Dr. Shishika Hewa-Vitharana, and Dr. Shun Ping Ding for support and guidance throughout the entire process. Um, your help with experimental design and going over writing each chapter and suggesting these new tests to do was absolutely huge. And I, um, yeah, I'm so grateful for your support with that. It was really nice to have you all there along the way. Um, then I wanted to thank uh, all the Strawberry Center staff, a few names in particular. I wanted to thank uh, Nicole Lyons, Allison Stevens, Kyle Blauer, uh, Vivian Longacre and Sam Faro. They were all very helpful to me in my lab work and also just getting logistics with uh, like tuition and things like that. And so it was a huge help. And I really think the Strawberry Center as a whole just really uh, perpetuates this team-based culture, which I, I could not be more grateful for um, to feel like I was part of such a great team for so many years. And then I wanted to thank my family and friends for, yeah, being a base that I can build on to achieve uh, both professional and personal goals. So thank you everyone who's been with me for the last few years. And with that, I'll uh, leave it to questions. Okay, thank you, Michael, for an excellent presentation. Um, I don't have any any uh, questions in the chat or the Q and A, but uh, we're ready to uh, field questions from the audience. Um, anybody? Uh, anybody? I'll I'll start and give everybody a chance. Oh, uh, there's uh, Jim is raising his hand. Jim, do you want to? Yeah, start? Gerald, go go ahead. I'll go after you. I'll go after you, Gerald. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Michael, let's say I'm a strawberry grower. And uh, I just listened to your presentation, but there's a lot of information there. And I'm, I want to know, like, what's the take home for me as a grower? What, how do I change my behavior uh, if I'm going to incorporate the, the results of your work? Well, I think um, it, it starts by really practicing uh, what's been preached for the last few years and in integrated pest management, because with documenting fungicide resistance, that's only the end result of a problem that stems from uh, turning to these chemicals to be the main controller of diseases like powdery mildew. So I think it's, it's huge to emphasize cultural control within strawberry production. So that comes with both the host plant resistance, which is now a, a new tool. And uh, hopefully once it's published, it will be clear in those charts and graphs to show what cultivars are less susceptible to mildew and which ones are more susceptible. But then I think it's also important to, if you decide to use chemical you control. By the way. I, I am, yes, okay. yeah. I think it's also important that if you decide to use chemical control to use multiple modes of action or uh, use multi-site fungicides as well. And so, yeah, I, I think those are the big take-home points for, for any grower. Well, don't, don't wait to publish it to make it available, right? You have the results now. So um, right. well, you've been presenting uh, this information to growers already, mm -hmm. haven't you? Yes, I've, I've gotten to present this information um, at, I believe now, two different field days, um, one with the small fruits and vegetables meeting uh, with UC uh, Cooperative Extension and then uh, our own Strawberry Center field day. And also as to the greater plant pathology community as abstracts for this year's uh, uh, plant health meeting. Okay, uh, Jim, you wanna go ahead? 
Yeah, and I did notice that Kelly also has a question. Um, so, let, uh, but I, I'll go ahead, Michael. Gerald really asked my main question, which was management recommendations. But first of all, I just wanted to congratulate you on a really well designed, well done project and uh, excellent presentation. So nice job all the way around. Thank you. Um, so you you did see pretty good um, correlation between the results of the lab test and the field test, but there were a couple, um, a couple of the um, data points were different. And when you did the overall analysis, it was still, um, it still showed a correlation. But I'm wondering if you've thought about, number one, is it unusual for the lab and the field data to give you different results? And number two, um, why do you think you saw some differences? Um, I think I, I can't speak as much to uh, different results between the lab and field data since that was um, that was the only experiment really done that I had observed results on live plants. Um, everything else has been just anecdotal uh, from growers or from the, the commission, uh, the people working with the commission about reduced efficacy, but nothing speaking toward resistance. And I, I do think in, in future work, um, I don't know if you saw, but the, the sample size or the, um, the number of reps weren't huge. So I think it was a, a higher chance for it to, uh, to get a result like that with uh, microbutanol where there was no disease incidence. But I think over the multiple isolates tested and the two from organic production, it showed that it was pretty solid results coming from the, the lab assay. But I think to do a larger confirmation, if I were to do this live plant trial, Again, I would probably do the lab assay with six or nine reps instead of just three. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, have you got Hey, a Michael, this is Kelly Ivers. Um, you look so nice. Um, great presentation. I really like your talk and yeah, you. your research. So um, um, I have a question. So. Uh, I'm wondering, you might not have collected this data, but maybe you have an opinion on it. Did you see any difference between the leaves and the fruit as far as susceptibility goes? And do you think that the fruit is more susceptible or less susceptible? And it, it, if you did notice any differences, were there any different host resistance reactions between the fruit and the foliage. I um, I did not notice a huge difference between the, the leaves and the fruit, but I, I do think this is a very important question to address. And um, also, sorry, just to reiterate that in case people didn't hear, it was asking if there was a difference between susceptibility of leaves and fruit, um, anything that I had observed. And so I, I know, yeah, this is very important to a lot of growers, especially because mildew on the fruit immediately makes it unmarketable. Uh, but I did not notice a, a huge difference in susceptibility of leaves and fruit. It seemed like the cultivars that were more susceptible were more susceptible all over. And I, I did notice very bad infection on a lot of the fruit, like that that first photo I had or in the in the first few slides, but no, I, I didn't make any quantified observations, but I think that would be really interesting for future work. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question from uh, David Goduri uh, at Cornell. He's asking, how do you separate let you mute. How do you separate the uh, fungicide resistance development within a fruit production field within a season from the resistance due to isolates that might be coming in from on the transplants from a nursery? Mm. Now you can unmute. That um, 
that would be really uh, an, also an interesting thing to look at. I, I didn't do that or that wasn't the aim of this study, but I think it could be, uh, at least in California, I know there's pesticide use reporting and that is open access to everyone. So I think it would be really interesting to take the data you get from certain fields and compare the grower spray program to the spray program used by the nursery for powdery mildew. And so that could answer that question, but I am not totally sure because we only tested one nursery isolate and it was pretty resistant all across the board, but it's only one isolate. So I couldn't say for sure that that's true of every isolate coming from a nursery. But yeah, the way to separate it out again would be pesticide use uh, reports. There's this, a question from Scott Steinmoss. Uh, Scott's the department head. For those on the call who don't know Scott, Scott's the department head in horticulture and crop science. But Scott asks, based on your results, would you recommend uh, rotations among frac codes uh, each season or mixtures of different modes of action within the same season? If it's And if mixtures, should the efficacy of each mode of action be similar or is it okay if they are different? That was a lot of questions. And okay. <laughs> want me to read? Want me to so, state it again? I think I can. I can break it down um, one by one. And so, I I think that within the, I think that most of resistance management should be done within the season, and that is because powdery mildew, especially in California reproduces via these canidia and canidia are not surviving on strawberry plants that have been disked into a field. And so I think the, the higher concern is of resistance developing within a season, which could be another interesting experiment, you know, going back to a field multiple times throughout a season and um, seeing if resistance is increasing or not. And then I, I also believe that yeah, mixing fungicides with different modes of action is best. And that is only from observing that Luna sensation was the, um, the most, or it had the, the least uh, disease incidence for each isolate. And so what was also interesting about Luna sensation and kind of answers the, the third part of your question is that it had, uh, Trifloxystrobin, one of the uh, ingredient or one of the active ingredients or the only active ingredient in Flint, which is another product that we used in this assay. And actually, the the points where there was some disease incidence to Luna sensation, the, there was actually a pretty high disease incidence to Flint. So it would probably be best to use mixes or um, mixes with two highly successful modes of action. Within the same season. Within the not, same season. Not season to season, right? Right, yeah. Well, All of this is within the same season. I think, I think it would be pretty hard to carry resistance over unless we did make some breakthrough and somehow find that uh, Chasmothecia were serving as the primary inoculum and they were overwintering in fields. That's really interesting. We have time for another question. Dan Lagarde has a question. And Scott, did you want to follow up first uh, with a, in your question? Well, no, that's really interesting, Michael, because you have this, um, you know, because you don't have that, that same phenomenon that goes on with weeds, right? Of course, I'm always going back to that. You know, you don't have the seed bank, right? Because it, it comes in, the powdery mildew comes in every year, it, and it's new every year. It's kind of a fresh infection every year. Is that right? There's no there's no carryover from the soil? Yeah, typically there's not, especially because it requires that live plant tissue to survive. And so um, even like in the lab, once the, once the leaves uh, went necrotic <coughs> on the plates, they were immediately overtaken by other, other fungi that were out competing the mildew. So it definitely wouldn't overwinter on any of that plant material. Hmm. Implications. So 
Okay, I'll I'll go since he called me up a little earlier. Uh, interesting presentation, Michael. I you know it reminds me that when you ask some good questions, you end up with more questions and answers at the end of it all. Usually, even when you have successful in your research. Um, do you, I guess I have a two part. One is, do you feel, I think you had 19 isolates. Do you, do you feel that's a uh, large enough set uh, to be representative of the populations in California? I think uh, compared to previous research, uh, a lot of these uh, resistance assays were performed with uh, thing, like with in the 15 to 30 isolate range. So I think that fits with previous research, uh, but obviously more is, is always better. Um, I do think though it, it did bring out some, some general trends and I think it, it really painted a, a picture of, yeah, the larger uh, resistance profile in California. I, I think that first graph I showed or that first chart with all 19 isolates, um, I think that showed, or that would, uh, if I got more isolates, that would contribute to that type of result or to those results that you saw there. Well, I think it's, I'm impressed you were able to look at 19 isolates actually. I used to work on strawberry and I hated working on powdery mildew. It was such a big pain trying to manage the isolates and keep them because it's an obligate parasite. Um, the other quest, second part of my question is, I thought it was really interesting that in the, um, and you, you touched on this a little bit earlier in a previous question, I think from Dave, that um, there were, was no resistance in the organic field and yet most organic plants come from the same nurseries as conventional plants do. And lo and behold, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is that a lot of the resistance starts in the nursery and it's just carried down because they're using these products in the nursery, the same products, a lot of the same products, maybe more. And so I wonder if you thought about that, you know, what you kind of touched on what might have been, might what might be going on in the organic field, but I thought it was quite interesting that these organic isolates were um, completely susceptible. Yeah, I think that um, that would further support the, um, the second uh, conclusion that was suggested in that it, it could very well be that um, the, resi or the mutations that confer resistance uh, come with a fitness cost of some sort. And so these uh, resistant isolates or individuals are just getting outcompeted by healthier uh, individuals that uh, may not have the resistant mutation, but would just be able to perform better in the absence of that of selection pressure from fungicides. So that would be something really interesting to, to study as well. Um, yeah, like you said, more questions. Okay, uh, I think we're, we're at the top of the hour. It's a little past uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm sure that Michael would be uh, interested in answering questions uh, beyond uh, what he was able to answer today. You have the ability to ask those questions through email or you can always email Michael directly or me. Be happy to pass them on. Uh, anyways, I wanna thank everybody for joining us and I wanna thank Michael for an excellent presentation. Uh, so, uh, we're going to stay here a little bit longer with Michael, but, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to, we're going to end the session now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone.